How about now, Zoom folks, can you hear me? Does anyone on Zoom confirm that they can hear me? Okay, cool. We'll switch this back again. There's never a dull moment. Okay, so folks on Zoom have no idea what we're doing. Folks on Zoom, what we're doing is talking about mannequins, specifically the family Pippridae, and they are amazing for many different reasons. So just superficially, the array of colors that you see among those 46 species of mannequins is really impressive, but their behaviors are also spectacular. So there are mannequins, and there's no sound with this one. Um, there are mannequins that do the actual moonwalk. So uh, the red cat mannequin does a series of backwards small hops that make them do a, a really engaging moonwalk. In fact, it's so engaging that people online can't stop putting music. <laughs> Too much music. Um, so it's actually hard to find red cap displays that people haven't overlaid with some sort of music because they are doing such an incredibly engaging dance. Some mannequins don't need musical accompaniment. They do it themselves. So this is Macaropterus deliciosus, the club-winged mannequin. And this bird is making that not only a tick sound as it hits its wings together, it's also making that, uh, that violin-like violin ting. The same species in ultra uh, ultra slow motion, so 500 frames per second. You can see how this bird is making this sound by hitting its enlarged reiki together at incredibly high speed. And we know that those sounds are caused not just by the percussion of these uh, of these feathers hitting each other, but there's an actual plectrum and file system. So uh, so this is a, a form of stridulation, like a grasshopper. So the um, hitting the, the wings together makes the little uh, edges of their uh, of their expanded reiki bump across themselves and make a sound like a violin. Mannequins do other things. Some of them have really elaborate dance teams. This is Chirexifia caudata, um, and, and an extreme version where a lot of males have teamed up together to perform a courtship display for a female, shown there on the far left. That guy is the alpha male and everybody else freezes at the end of this display, waiting to see what the female does next. And so these sorts of displays all occur in what is called a lek. And so uh, a lek is also found in North American birds like, uh, like prairie chickens, where, um, and the, the, they uh, share some commonalities across different species that do these sorts of behaviors. So in all lekking birds, there are display courts physically separate areas where males come and do their courtship displays. And there are multiple males that compete for the attention of females. Females come and visit the lek and they're very choosy about who they actually mate with. So they visit multiple males before they make a choice. And in general, there's high reproductive skew. Only a few of these males actually populate after lots of time and energy spent uh, courting females in this lek. In all lecking species, uh, females care for the offspring. I'll come back to whether they care for the displays in a little bit. Uh, but uh, across all these lecking species, males never take any part in raising the offspring. Of course, the females lay the eggs, but they also find the nest sites, build the nests. They do all the provisioning of the young. Um, and, uh, and the males never interact with their offspring at all. They continue courting other females and mate with as many females as are willing to copulate with. Um, and uh, across mannequins, uh, the females are um, kind of without exception, small and green and about the size and exact color of leaves. And so along with the anecdote that the word mannequin comes from little male, early explorers who were identifying mannequins actually uh, uh, had a hard time realizing that the females um, were even the same species as the males they were collecting. They're just so different. Um, and so let me move this out of the way. Um, and so you might be wondering why, uh, why mannequins are, are, are so, uh, so, not just mannequins, but why flashy, amazing birds are so common in the tropics in general. And so this isn't only mannequins like this wire-tailed mannequin, but also things like Katingas, cock of the rocks, and in New Guinea, things like birds of paradise, some of the most spectacular birds that you find out there occur in the tropic zone. So between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. 
And there are a couple well-supported ideas about why that is. Um, first, this is an area of the world that has a very long evolutionary history of relatively nice weather. And survival tends to be higher and fewer species are migratory over time. Um, overall, that adds up to less extinction on a species by species level, um, more specialization that can lead to speciation and new, new variation, and which kind of sums up to more uh, bird awesomeness possible in this region of the world. It also has some really important implications for what these birds eat. So in this tropical climate, fruit is relatively abundant. Um, and in fact, fruit is abundant year round. So that means that within this zone of the world, there's quite a lot of fruit givery. And that's important because fruit has a couple of really distinctive important features. Um, ecologists often say fruit wants to be eaten. So fruit is bright, fruit is in accessible areas, fruit wants to be eaten in that when animals eat fruit, especially animals like birds, they move the seeds to new locations. And so the fruit is a mechanism to get animals to eat the seeds, move them someplace else. And the animal gets quick energy from this food. Uh, fruits are generally really high in sugar. In contrast, you know, there are other things you could eat, but Insects in the tropics include a lot of things that are quite hard to find. Um, you can see these cryptic uh, uh, mantises and stick insects, and also quite a lot of very well defended insects, things that are spiny and generally unpleasant if you're trying to eat them. But uh, with respect to mannequins and displaying birds in particular, fruit has been highlighted as really important for those sorts of wild displays that we started with. Basically, when animals spend less time looking for food, they can spend more time being a parent and single parenting is possible. So, um, so just being able to raise a brood of offspring without constantly looking for insects, if you have a reliable source of fruit, might be a really important thing that's let animals uh, um, uh, separate male and female roles. And then on top of that, fruit is high energy. There's a lot of sugar. So high energy food creates the potential for high energy displays. Um, and on top of that, sorry, I don't know how to make this go away. Uh-huh. There we go, awesome. <laughs> so on top of that, the, uh, the pigments that are present in fruit um, are incorporated into birds' feathers during feather development. And in some cases, the really bright reds and oranges that are found in tropical birds are, uh, are made possible by their fruit-rich diets. So fruit turns out to be really important. In fact, uh, David Snow, who passed away in 2009, but it was a, a giant of tropical ecology, um, was the first to identify fruit as kind of a key part of, uh, of lecking species. He wrote, it's surely for this reason that lek behavior, which entails the presence of displaying birds on their display perches for the greater part of the day, has evolved in some groups of frugivorous tropical forest birds and not in insectivorous birds. So it's really hard to find an insectivorous lecking bird. Um, they just don't have the time for this kind of thing. So I wanna take a little time to give you an introduction in, to the, the mannequin family tree and point out some, uh, some key species um, throughout the phylogeny that, that really make mannequins stand apart from other birds. And to think about this family tree, it's important to think about kind of what's at the base. And the base of the mannequin family tree are the New World flycatchers, um, which is a very large diverse group of birds that are pretty much all brown and mostly eat insects. Um, so this is an ochre-bellied flycatcher, not a mannequin, and its display looks like this. Pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so they, this is actually a lecking species. They do eat some fruit, um, and within, within uh, New World flycatchers, quite a lot of them uh, are purely insectivorous and not lecking. But, if you move into what is qualified as part of the mannequin family tree, Neopelma, the tyrant mannequins, look quite a lot like that relatively brown, beautiful flycatcher. Um, so saffron-crested tyrant mannequin, pale-bellied tyrant mannequin, and Sierra tyrant mannequin. 
So they differ in that they do have uh, some cool crown patches. Males display alone, but in kind of loose aggregations that are called exploded leks. Um, and there is no single display perch that the males are reliably coming back to. Um, but they've added jumps into the repertoire. So this is the worst of the videos that I'll show you tonight. But you can see this saffron crested and tyrant manning, mannequin um, doing not only little noises, but also a leap uh, incorporated into its courtship display. Up to the mannequin family tree, you get to Xenopipo. And this is a genus that has two different species that are quite drab. They're literally called the black mannequin and the olive mannequin. And so that's, that's just as boring as you can possibly get. In fact, uh, Kirwan and Green, who wrote a, a really spectacular book on mannequins and katingas, said uh, this somewhat dumpy and atypical mannequin um, has a male display that is distinctly unspectacular and undemonstrative by Pippa Day standards, consisting solely of crawls and chases amongst rival males with no special display grounds. And so here, I'm going to have to ask to, to stop the recording. Can you do that? On Because uh, currently we're recording on Zoom, are we not? Yep. Can you pause the recording for just a moment? Because what I'm about to show you is that exciting that we are. All right. So, uh, so Xena Pipo um, does jumps, but it turns out they're way fancier than you would have expected. They've got a backflip thrown in. Um, so there's a dramatic increase in acrobatic performance as you're moving up through the mannequin uh, family tree. And this genus is also sexually dimorphic. Females are green and males are more colorful. They're still kind of drab. Um, in the genus Antilophia, these are the helmeted mannequins. There are two different mannequins that are found in Brazil. Um, the helmeted mannequin in, uh, in South Central Brazil and the Arepe mannequin um, in this little tiny patch of Atlantic forest. So keep zooming in. It's only found in this one extremely range restricted section of an, an endangered forest in central Brazil. And this species was only discovered in 1997. That's how range restricted it is. Um, so there are still, there are currently only a few hundred birds left uh, alive and it is under extreme risk of extinction. Um, the habitat looks like this. Um, and there is a protected reserve established in that area, but humans uh, move into the area for hunting. They burn the forest in order to move game through from the area and it's causing continued declines for this species. So it's a pretty grim situation right now, but an absolutely spectacular bird. And so the courtship display of this bird has been described, um, even though it was only recently discovered, and it's not too complicated. So males have perches and they do this kind of interesting multi-male uh, display chase. We're not quite sure. Um, two males regularly interact in a way that might be cooperative. Um, so there's a much more ornamented plumage going on here, maybe a bit of male-male coordination, um, but it's nothing compared to the next genus, which we'll come back to in a little bit, the genus Chirexithia. So this is the one where males form multi-male teams and they work together to attract females. It goes from beyond coordination to actual cooperation, where only one male of a team actually copulates with the females, but all of the males take part in the displays that attract them. Um, and so there are five different species in this genus, including long-tailed mannequin and lance-tailed mannequin. This is the duet call of a, a long-tailed mannequin. And so males will perch side by side and repeat this duet um, for, uh, I think Dave McDonald estimated something like a million times a year. They'll go for hours at a stretch of, of repeating this call until a female comes in and then go down and do their courtship dance. And it turns out the uh, social alliances that these males form early in life are actually important predictors of their success later in life. So we've learned a lot about social networking from mannequins. And, uh, just in case you're concerned that I'm going to go through all 46 species, I'm just skimming across some of the tops of the mannequin tree. There are quite a lot to, to talk about, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the genus Mannequins. So there are quite a few species in this genus, and they all perform displays that involve uh, really resounding wing snaps um, that are performed while males jump among vertical uh, saplings. So the males clear a court, um, and then snap 
between leaves. And so it's loud enough that it's like a whip cracking. You can actually hear this snap in the forest for more than a kilometer. And they sometimes do that. <laughs> so there's actually a flatulent noise thrown in here as they leap from the ground to the courtship stick where they perform copulations. This male doesn't have a female present right now. But as before, um, high-speed video has showed us a lot about how males are actually making this display. And it's different than the other mannequins making snaps and clicks. So they're actually feeding together flattened radius bones of their wings um, at an extremely high speed. So this is the fastest twitch rate that's ever been measured for a vertebrate muscle. And, uh, and they do that at such a high rate that was a second and a half of footage back there um, that it, it creates a, a resounding snap noise. So mannequins have specialized structures associated with display, both on their bodies and in the forest. They have extremely high performance uh, athletic ability. Um, and, and they're doing these displays, again, in a lek where multiple males will have those quarts of vertical sticks in an area about the size of this room. You might have 10 or 15 males crowded in here. Um, and then last but not least, I'll talk about Cora Pipo, which uh, charmingly means the dancing puppet um, named for their, for their courtship display. Um, and so this is uh, things like the white ruffed mannequin. And males of Cora Pipo perform a display that is facultatively uh, multi-male. So sometimes there are multiple males involved, um, sometimes not. And they engage in altitudinal migration. So their courtship is done on a mossy log that is fallen and partially degraded in the forest. And part of the display takes place actually above the canopy while the female sits on the log. Here we have two males displaying with no female in sight right here, but the males perform a flight where they actually fly vertically, dancing puppet, right? Um, and uh, around in circles as, uh, as the, the bird on the log watches. So here's a, um, a zoom in of the flap chihuahua as the bird comes in from its high, uh, from its high circle over the canopy and does this uh, really dramatic sudden display on the log. Um, and so if there was a female present, he would actually be flipping over her as he lands on the log there. So Cora people Altera is found in montane wet forests where it rains a lot. You're talking multiple meters a year. Um, and these birds get really stressed from rainstorms. This is work done by Alice Boyle at Kansas State University, where she tagged birds in these high montane forests in Costa Rica and found that as rain set in, um, they literally get measurably stressed. So they have elevated stress hormones. There's evidence that they stop eating. So they stop being able to forage because it's raining so much they can't fly out and get the fruit. Um, and they rely on stored fat in order to survive these rainy events. Um, and Alice documented that these birds fly down slope um, to less rainy areas in order to avoid these costs of high rainfall. But when they do so, they lose their social status. So log holding males have a reason to stick it out as long as they possibly can when they fly down slope so that they can forage um, and then try to come back, they've been demoted to floater in the population. So across all of these mannequins, there are some commonalities that are reasons why there are so many people that are studying this group of birds. So clearly, um, as with uh, any animal that kind of develops a, a high muscular skill performance, um, practice makes perfect. These animals are practicing quite a lot. But in order to perform these courtship displays, there is a really complex coordinated action of the neural processes, the biomechanics, um, the hormonal regulation of displays and behavior and energetics that let them do these sorts of, uh, of displays. Um, all of this is integrated into a, a, an amazing suite of physical traits and individual behavior. And so these are all the reasons why we're, we're fascinated with studying mannequins in this mannequin RCN group. Um, and there are quite a few people who are especially interested not in the birds and their nitty gritty physiology, but instead how they interact with their environment. Mannequins are major seed dispersers and they're found throughout different forest types and forest levels in, in the neotropics. 
all throughout Central and South America. And they're great, under, they're great models for understanding uh, tropical bird ecology and evolution. And so that's why this group of people came together united by the fact that the golden collared mannequin was one of the first kind of atypical non-zebra finch birds to have a really high quality genome sequence. Um, and developed the Mannequin Research Coordination Network, which includes people who study ecology, behavior, physiology, evolution, genomics, bioinformatics, audiovisual data. Actually, Mike studies fairy wrens, but we let him come anyway. Um, and it includes people across all uh, career stages, from grad students to professors, postdocs, and people who aren't in academia at all, um, and from all over the world. So we have a wonderful contingent from Brazil, Colombia, the United States, and so forth. And this group is led by Betty Loisel at University of Florida. And for the past five years, we've been working to try to bring together genomic information to understand mannequin ecology and evolution more specifically, developing new genomes for all these species, including the one that I work on, um, and uh, working together to try to provide new perspectives on the evolution of traits and behavior. Um, and the, the key thing that we keep coming back to in this group is trying to understand the consequences of strong sexual selection for genome structure. And so in fact, in those, uh, the kind of description of why mannequins are so amazing, um, I laid out being in the tropics, eating fruit, um, being emancipated from paternal duties at the nest, but all of those things eventually come back to the idea of sexual selection. So the idea that there are differences among individuals in their success in mating and passing on their genes. Sexual selection is a really big part of why mannequins are fascinating. But of course, sexual selection is not just a mannequin thing. So sexual selection gets the credit for a lot of the most amazing things that you find in nature, whether it's the biggest rhinoceros beetles uh, being most successful in grappling competitions with other individuals, or uh, on the fishy extreme here, we have a, um, a courtship arena that's been created by a pufferfish um, underwater in an Asian ocean. Um, so sexual selection uh, has benefited really extremely from information about birds. So a lot of the key studies that provided evidence that uh, sexual selection can occur came from studies of wild birds. And in general, sexual selection is defined as differences in reproductive success due to differences in getting mates. So this is different from natural selection where uh, it's about survival. Instead, this is, some would say, a version of natural selection where individuals can pass on their genes excessively or fail to pass on their genes without actually dying if they differ in their ability to, to, uh, to get mates. When Darwin first identified sexual selection as a major mechanism of evolution, he identified two different ways it could work. So intrasexual competition is competition between individuals of the same sex, usually male-male, but it can also be female-female. And this idea was really readily accepted. It makes sense that the biggest, strongest male would be to beat up the others and be able to access females. But the more controversial version of this is intersexual mate choice, usually females choosing males. And so from a Victorian perspective, this was not as easily stomached. Um, the idea that females might be making choices that change the direction of a species. But even today, uh, mate choice as a mechanism of sexual selection remains really problematic for some of the reasons that I'll talk about today. Um, as consumers of nature, people who've watched nature shows and paid attention to why things are happening around you, um, there are things that might seem really obvious about sexual selection. So um, females are generally thought to pick males because they get the good genes that those males have or because by mating with a sexy male, they have sexy sons who are themselves successful in the future. If you watch an average nature program that has some sort of flashy bird in it, these two possibilities will get mentioned. Um, and so this is basically the idea that if you think about what's going on in this female's head, she might be thinking, he must have some great genes to look that great and not be dead. Or maybe one day my sons will be just as amazing as he is and this is driving her choice. One of the other kind of widely accepted things that you won't get much pushback if you say out loud is that traits that are obvious 
previously displayed in courtship are the targets of female choice. So in terms of trying to understand what females are using to make their choices, the things that males are waving in their face during courtship make sense, right? And it's also just assumed that female mate preferences within a species are consistent and generally genetic, um, and that, uh, that their preferences for observable male traits. That's sort of the starting point for all the mathematical models of sexual selection. And it's generally con uh, considered that females of a species prefer something. Um, and lastly, it's a common assumption that uh, more elaborate species are under stronger sexual selection. Okay, and so now I'll bring you to the bird that has led me to question all of these things, the lance-tailed mannequin. And so um, lance-tailed mannequins are, uh, are a bird that I've studied from my first year in graduate school. These guys are Chiroxithia lanceolata. They're strongly sexually dimorphic. There's so two males in the middle and the female on the right. They're found in Panama, Colombia, and Northern Venezuela. They display for females in an exploded leg, which means that the males that females visit are spread out in space and females have to fly a little bit about 100 to 200 meters between males to visit them. Females observe multiple males before they make a mate choice. And then they leave and nest outside their mates display areas. And they live uh, a really long time. So up to 17 years that we've documented in this population which is not unusual for mannequins. The unusual thing here is that we know exactly how old the, the birds are in our population. Most mannequins seem to be quite long lived. And so um, there are five different species in this genus and they all have cooperative courtship displays. In lance-tailed mannequins, that looks like this. So there's a duet song like that duet that I showed of long-tailed mannequins, but it sounds a little different. So that's two males overlapping their songs by uh, a tenth of a second. It ends up uh, pr producing kind of a richer sound than a single bird uh, calling, sort of like hearing something in stereo in a, in a movie theater. And then if a female comes into the area, the pair flies down to a low display perch about half a meter off the ground, and they start a cooperative two male dance. So this can include up to 11 different courtship elements. They alternate up and down leaps. They go back and forth like little robots on the dance perch. And then everyone's favorite is this, uh, um, a leapfrog display. So that's the female on the dance perch now, and the alpha and the beta male. There we go. And they'll do this leapfrog in bouts of about a minute and a half, break it up with some slow flight, go back to leapfrog, break it up with slow flight, and alternate bits of the display. An individual display can last as long as 45 minutes, extreme. So by the end of some of these displays, the males are panting with their mouth open. This is really energetically expensive. Um, and so a typical display has a two male component with both the alpha and his subordinate beta partner doing the courtship display. Then at some point the beta leaves and the alpha continues by himself. And if he's lucky, he calculates. But uh, about half of the displays don't involve the beta at all. It's just the alpha picking up with the sections of the display that one male typically performs. And those can also end with copulation. So I started studying this species in 1999 in, on an island in Western Panama. Um, and I work on a 46 hectare area of secondary growth, dry tropical forest with 25 to 35 active male display areas on this site um, every year. And I should say, I don't do this alone. Pearl Rivers here in the second row is also involved in this work and has also devoted years of her life to, uh, to studying these birds. Across all 23 years of data collection so far, I'm, uh, I'm listing greater than numbers here because I haven't added the last three years of numbers and you get the idea. We've done, quite a lot of data collection in this population. So more than 3,800 uh, captures of birds with nearly, uh, or actually we're at 2,500-ish individuals captured in the population over time. Um, nearly 2,000 chicks at this point with paternity assigned um, and, uh, and more than 15,000 hours of sitting in the forest and writing down what these birds are doing to identify social relationships. So what we found from this, um, are that these male partners are not each other's close relatives. So they're not passing on their genes by helping relatives. Um, that it's, you can identify alpha status reliably 
by presence, time spent at the display area, um, these EEC displays. That's totally the alpha. Um, and the alphas are the only males who do solo displays when a female is around. And we do know that females choose among and mate with only alpha males. So, uh, so there are 3%, so only, I mean, except for 3% of offspring are sired by beta males, um, but, but really the way to have offspring is to be an alpha. Um, from a beta perspective, these subordinate males who take part in these displays are improving their chances of becoming an alpha later on in life. And so this system, lance-tailed mannequins, is a truly outstanding system for studying not only cooperation, but also the process of mate choice, because we can tell who these females are assessing, unlike something like a lack of those uh, prairie chickens where the males are quite close together, males are spread out, and so you can tell which male an individual is visiting. We can track females with transmitters or on video and get their color bands to know who they're actually looking at. Genetic paternity tests, um, so a la Jerry Springer, tell us who is actually siring the chicks in this population. And at this point, we know age and lifespan for many of these individuals. So what have we learned? Insight about sexual selection. Um, the, the insight that we get from lance tail mannequins is, uh, is always, challenging. Um, and so what we found is that the very obvious male traits are not related to reproductive success. So the just look at them approach to deciding what females might be paying attention to, attention to has fallen completely flat in this species. In fact, uh, the most obvious fascinating thing that females should be paying attention to, right, is, uh, is this two male display. This is the, what distinguishes lanceolata. And Instead, we find that when males perform the display entirely solo without their beta partner, they're more likely to get to copulate. And so males are more likely to copulate after a solo display than after one that involves that two male component that is the iconic like, definition of what it is to be a lanceolata. Um, on, on top of that, it seems like doing that two male display has more to do with things about the male than things about the female. So uh, males are less likely to display with their partner as they gather more years of experience as an alpha. Um, it doesn't matter which female is viewing them or where she is in her courtship process. It's, uh, it's the male's experience that predicts how many males are actually doing this display. Um, and yes, we have thought about checking other traits as well. I have a laundry list of things that we've examined correlations of success with, colors and tail length, things like that. And generally, I mean, really across the board, physical traits don't predict siring success. Instead, what we find is that there's a slightly complicated relationship of age and experience with success in siring offspring. So, um, so here we have age on the x-axis and year as an alpha on the y-axis. And uh, basically, as males move through this trajectory, they get better and better, and it starts to tail off. So you can get too old as a mannequin and start to experience senescence. Very young males do not seem to be at all attractive. Um, and there's a sweet spot in the middle age here where males can, uh, can really accumulate reproductive success. We also found that age and experience matter for females. The older females, choose mates differently than younger females. When we put transmitters on females and followed them around the forest with automated scanners underneath male display perches, older females visit fewer males before they make a mate choice, um, and they visit them for longer displays, seem to put them through their paces more. Whereas younger females visit more males consistent with gathering information when they're, they're early in the, the, the lifetime experience of choosing mates. And like males, females live a very long time. So their mate choices are not independent across years. They mate faithfully with a male that they've mated with previously 42% of the time when they have the chance. Um, and so that is as monogamous as a house wren, which is a very monogamous bird, when you look across years. Um, on top of that, in tracking females among display perches, we found that different females can end up viewing the same males and make different choices. So we track females back to their nests as well as monitoring which males they actually visited. And we're able to actually genetically uh, know for sure which of the viewed males she actually copulated with uh, or actually had offspring with. And, uh, and so 
females uh, don't arrive at the same opinion when they view the same individuals. It's also become abundantly clear that courtship displays are so hard to understand in part because they're conversations. So females are not passively sitting there observing male performances, but instead interacting with males as they display. So this is video from Carla Vanderbilt who completed her PhD looking at fine scale differences in display behavior. And one of her approaches here was to dissect exactly what the males and the female were doing in uh, to the decisecond across some really finely analyzed displays, showing that it's the combination of what the female is doing and what the males are doing that actually predict how the display is going. Um, so she used the same sort of multidimensional sequence analysis that's used in analyzing proteins, but instead used codes for, uh, for, for bird behavior to show that these, it's the, how these things mesh together that create different types and different success rates of these displays. Not a new idea. Of course, mate choice is an interactive process. Uh, in golden collared mannequins, females actually leap after the male, forcing the male to jump between these sticks during the courtship display. And it's the female who leaps first, sort of pushing male. And in things like this uh, finch, the cordon bleu, um, males do a uh, tap dance for their, for their partner. And they tap dance faster when they're with their, uh, their mate rather than some random female. Um, so in terms of like long-term projections about what should be happening with sexual selection, when you watch those nature videos, it seems like sexual selection is there, females are exerting preferences, and it's kind of constant over time. It turns out that really hasn't been measured very much. And so when we went uh, back in our data to look at how the potential for sexual selection to occur across years, this is what we found. So this is a measure of reproductive skew, just how unequal um, reproductive success is in the population, and a higher value means that fewer males are monopolizing more of the success in that year. And actually, I've been aware of this trend for a while. In the year 2000, when I first uh, gathered blood from offspring and figured out who the father was, the most successful male in the population sired 30% of the chicks that I sampled. And then for the next 12 years, um, the most successful male sired between 11 and 14% of the chicks. So I really thought I had just done it wrong in that first year. Maybe I stayed too close to his flex site or something like that. But in uh, 2013, it happened again at about the same level. And then again in 2016. What we're finding is that there are pulses of really extreme reproductive skew. And Pearl and I are working now to figure out exactly what's causing um, these pulses to happen in some years and not in others. But the punchline here is that it is definitely not the same thing in every year, um, and we're not sure what's causing this variation. And then again, working with that uh, mannequin RCN team, 40 researchers across that consortium of individuals uh, pooled their data on 15 mannequin species to address this question of whether um, elaboration relates to current strength of sexual selection, that kind of commonly assumed thing that, uh, that that animals that are more dichromatic, meaning more different in how males and females are colored, or that have more elaborate displays or more elaborate acoustic repertoires. So we don't just say vocal because mannequins have so many uh, sonations, not just vocalizations. Or things like social complexity. The prediction is that uh, the more elaborate species have stronger current sexual selection. And we found that that is not the case. So there's no relationship with current uh, uh, in une inequality in reproductive success and any of these four key traits. Okay, so where does this leave us? Um, clearly, much of what is assumed to be true about sexual selection does not hold up when closely examined, at least in mannequins. Um, and I've put forth that mannequins are a reasonable, reasonable place to look at these things things because they are truly icons of sexual selection. Um, this RCN has been designed around uh, mannequins as a, as a wonderful model for strongly sexually selected species. Um, and yet many of the key assumptions that we kind of generally make without much support have fallen apart when we pull strong data in to understand them in this strongly sexually selected group. Um, and it is also now abundantly clear that female behavior um, female behavior remains very poorly understood 
but female behaviors are proposed to be the selective force in sexual selective selection by mate choice. So here's this cartoon where drab females are watching ridiculous males and the males are saying, I've decided that this evolution thing is a vast female conspiracy. Um, if you think about things like examples of microevolutionary change across observable time in the beaks of Galapagos fishes, um, you all know this story that in extreme drought years, the food resources change and only birds that have beaks strong enough to crack the, the seeds that are available can survive. And in that case, the selective pressure is very clear and external to the birds, right? It is a drought, the food has changed. So there aren't actually comparable examples to populations changing by sexual selection. And I think that a big part of that is because the selective force that would be driving such changes, at least by mate choice, is the female brain. And we don't yet understand exactly how that selective force is working. So I've pitched mannequins as amazing, colorful, fascinating creatures, and they really are. But I admit that after all these years, this is the version of mannequins that I find most puzzling and fascinating and most likely to change our opinions about how sexual selection works. Um, and just a final thought here, like how do you take an obsession with one population of lance-tailed mannequins on one little island in Panama and think about uh, sexual selection more broadly? Like how dare I, right? Um, I've really spent a lot of hours sitting in the field trying to understand what's going on here. Um, and, uh, and one of the most satisfying things in recent years has been to take ideas that have been developed sitting in the field out of mannequins altogether and move into some mathematical modeling approaches. So with Elizabeth Hobson, Maria Servideo, and Courtney Fitzpatrick, um, I've been part of a, a working group at the Santa Fe Institute to try to better model the process of sexual selection and, uh, and change some of our initial assumptions about this whole thing works. So that is unfortunately not yet, not yet ready for prime time, but, uh, but I hope to share that soon. So what I hope that you'll take home from today's talk are mannequins really are amazing, both the males and the females. And there's much that we don't know. Um, and much of what is widely accepted to be true about sexual selection may be flat wrong. Um, and mannequins, more than most animal groups, really do offer incredible potential to test key ideas about sexual selection and to inspire the development of some new ones as well. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who's contributed to this work. There have been quite a lot of field technicians who've generated that really fine scale information on, uh, on lance-tailed mannequins. Alice Boyle generously shared her phylogenetic assessment of mannequins and uh, the videos that you saw earlier in this talk. Um, and, uh, and videos and stills came from uh, many different sources, uh, a lot from folks in that mannequin RCM. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how does disturbance affect mannequins and the whole process, all of these processes that are going on? You're right. Things like sage grouse are incredibly sensitive to disturbance. So an oil rig miles away will cause males to disperse and, and no longer take part. Um, mannequins are, uh, are highly variable in whether they care about that or not. Some species really require dense remote forests. Um, and species like the one that we work on, the lance-tailed mannequins, actually does really well with disturbance. They need a secondary growth structure, and, uh, and in intact forests, they only end up hanging out and displaying in basically tree falls and gaps and along rivers where disturbance keeps some undergrowth going. So the reason we have so many mannequins on our field site is that we have a massive force of human disturbance at work. Um, the land is kind of constantly clearing sections of the land, and, uh, and then sometimes running out of money and then it regrows. And uh, that turns out to be perfect for lance-tailed mannequins. A little traumatic for me, but, um, but they do really well with that. There are limits. 
um, that disturbance is getting amplified in recent years. And so um, what we hope to do to kind of make uh, lemonade out of lemons, if that continues, is to, um, is to look at how the social structure changes as habitat is lost. And so um, uh, the, there's a group in Ecuador right now that's looking at how mannequins recolonize uh, cleared areas that are growing back. Um, and so they'll have some information on that. And then we'll look at the depressing other end of things as habitat is lost, um, how are social alliances disrupted or, or maintained across these new gaps. Um, so it's highly variable and there's no one easy answer, but we are thinking about that. 